Well, hello, everyone. It's been a, a great morning already, hasn't it? Uh, isn't it great to gather together, uh, whether we're in the room or, or online, and worship our God? You may have uh, heard that there's two certainties in life. Can you, can you tell me what they are? Have you, have you heard what those two certainties might be? Death and taxes, I heard. Yes, that is right. Death and taxes, the two certainties in life. Well, today we're going to be talking about one of those. That's right, taxes. Okay, no, we're not. We're not going to talk about taxes. And I can just see you just heave a sigh of relief about that too. Um, but actually, I think death is the easier one to talk about anyway, because God has done something about death. But I do want to acknowledge up front that death is a reality for all of us. But some of us today, uh, might that, that, that might be a current reality. Death might be a reality that we are facing today, either for ourselves or with a loved one. And my prayer and hope for all of us today is that we would find hope and life in death. You know, as I said, God's done something about death. And yet, despite that, death is a, a subject, it's a topic that we don't feel all that comfortable talking about, is it? Now, think of all the ways that we dance around death. When someone has died, we don't say they've died. We use all sorts of other terms to describe that. We say they've passed away. They're at peace. Um, they're deceased, they're at rest, you know, they're at the pearly gates. We use all of these other terms instead of saying words like dead or died. And why is that? Why do we do that? Well, there's something about death that is final. And you might go, well, thanks for stating the obvious, Roger. You know, death sort of is final. But I wonder whether it's that finality that we're avoiding by using all these other ways to describe death. But is death final? Is death the end of it all? When I was uh, a young teenager, I was, I was around 12 or 13, I developed a tremendous fear of death. Uh, in fact, it, it was so much at some times I was really struggling to get to sleep because I didn't know if I died. These are the, you know, sort of thoughts that a young teenager has. If I didn't wake up in the morning, where would I find myself? Would I, would I go to heaven or would I go to that other place that we have trouble talking about as well? Hell. And I didn't know. And I would lie awake at night too afraid to go to sleep in case I didn't wake up in the morning. And it wasn't like I was sick or anything. I was very healthy. But that's, that was the fear that I had as a youngster about death. Until one Friday night, I prayed to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I want to follow you. Would you come and live in my heart? And one thing happened in that moment when I prayed that prayer. And it was instant. And I'll never forget it, is I experienced a peace. A peace that I'd never experienced before. It was the peace of Jesus. And I have never feared death since. Never. In this series where we're following the I am sayings of Jesus, we are exploring who Jesus is. Each of these statements that Jesus says about himself reveals something about him and who he is. The theologian Ben Witherington affirms the purpose of Jesus' I am sayings when he says, these I am sayings make clear that a major, if not the major function, is to reveal clearly who Jesus is and what he bestows on those who receive him. When I received Jesus at 13 years of age, he bestowed his peace on me. So what does Jesus reveal about himself in this statement, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Well, before we delve into that a bit deeper, let's set the scene a little bit first. Let's understand what's happening around this. So in the previous chapter, in John chapter 10, Jesus has had to, uh, in a sense, flee from Jerusalem because it was not a, a safe place for him to stay around anymore. So he left Jerusalem. It was too dangerous for him. And uh, so he's, he's moved to another place and he's staying there and he receives a message that his dear friend Lazarus is very ill. But Jesus tarries where he is for a few days after receiving that message. He doesn't leave straight away. Now, Lazarus lived in a village called Bethany. And Bethany was about two to three kilometres from Jerusalem. So Jesus, to go and visit Lazarus, had to go back into this a dangerous situation that he'd just left. So Jesus waits two days before setting off to Bethany. And when he arrives, we read that Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. You know, it's highly likely that Lazarus had actually already died before Jesus even received the message that he was unwell. Now, Martha, one of the sisters of Lazarus, Lazarus uh, hears that Jesus is on his way, that he's coming, and he's approaching the village of Bethany. And so she goes out and meets Jesus just on the outskirts of this village. And that's where we pick up the exchange between Jesus and Martha. In John chapter 11, verse 17, if you've got your Bibles, you can uh, uh, read along there. John 11, verse 17, or it'll be up on the screen as well. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God the one who has come into the world from God. So Jesus' statement there contains two parts. He says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Now Jesus tests the waters of Martha's understanding when he tells her that Lazarus will rise again. The Jews uh, had a belief, a, a doctrine about the resurrection. It's a core, basic, fundamental doctrine of Judaism, even to this day. They believed that the resurrection would occur on the very last day, called the Day of Judgment. And the Day of Judgment is the day of the resurrection of the dead, when those who are judged as righteous will then enter into the world to come. And the catalyst for all of these events occurring at the last day is the appearance or the arrival of the Messiah. Martha quotes this doctrine back to Jesus. In verse 24, when Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. But when he says that to her, he turns this doctrine on its head. First, he moves the doctrine from a statement of belief to a person. The resurrection is now contained in a person, namely Jesus. Second, he moves the resurrection from being a future event into the present. Jesus is standing right there in front of Martha in the here and now. And third, Martha and every other Jew 
would have recognized Jesus staking his claim to being the Messiah. We see this reflected in Martha's confession of faith to Jesus in verse 27, when she says, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. So Jesus makes this statement, I am the resurrection. And then he gives a little bit of explanation around that in the second part of verse 25, when he says, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Jesus is talking about a physical death. I don't have to explain to you that our physical bodies age and decay. Death is one of the certainties of life. But Jesus says that death is not the end. He says, here I am, Martha. I'm right here, standing in front of you. And I am the resurrection. Death is not the end. So who is Jesus? He is the Son of God whom death cannot hold down. And his claim is validated by his own resurrection from the dead, which we celebrated just a few weeks ago on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Now Jesus also made the claim, I am the life. How do you define life? Is life just a physical condition? Is it the drawing in of breath and exhaling it back out again? Is that life? I presume that you're all alive here today. You're all drawing in breath. Let's just make sure of that. After me, breathe in. Hold it. Hold it. Breathe out. Okay. Is that life? Is that all life is? Or is life uh, more a social experience? Is life about relationships? Or is life, perhaps to you, about having a good time and about happiness, about enjoying yourself and partying and doing what feels good? In his gospel, John uses the word, the Greek word for life, 36 times. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, between them combined, use this same Greek word 16 times. From that alone, we get the sense that life is important to John and he wants to convey that sense of of importance to us. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection, the question is, what are we resurrected to? And Jesus answers that in the second part of his statement when he says, I am the life. We are resurrected to life, spiritual life. And in verse 26, Jesus gives a little explanation about that statement when he says, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Now, Jesus isn't contradicting himself here in the space of a breath. We will die physically, but when we live in Jesus, believing that he is the Messiah and death cannot hold him down, then we will never die spiritually. Who is Jesus? He is the one who brings life. In the previous chapter, John chapter 10, Jesus says that he has come that we may have life, but not just any old life. He says that he has come that we may have life to the full, that we may have abundant life, that we may have a rich and satisfying life. That is who Jesus is. Jesus brings us that life in the present, now. And then he also brings um, uh, spiritual life in the future. Well, after explaining all that to Martha, Jesus asks her, do you believe this, Martha? Jesus' statement to Martha necessitated a response. And I believe Jesus requires a response from us today too. Jesus is concerned with how we respond to who he is. 
we can't ignore him and just carry on in blissful ignorance. He challenged Martha and he challenges us today too. So let me ask you, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection? Lord over death. And do you believe he is the life? The only one through whom we can find and have a rich and satisfying life now and a future eternal spiritual life. Do you believe this? Well, as we read on, we see different responses to Jesus, to Jesus' challenge. Let's pick it up in verse 45 of of, uh, chapter 11. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. That was the resurrection of Lazarus. But some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. Caiaphas, who was high priest at that time, said, You don't know what you're talking about. You don't realise that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own. As high priest at that time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. And not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered, through, scattered around the world. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. We see in that little passage there a number of different responses. We see belief. We see jealousy. We see fear. And we see rejection. Some of the Jewish and religious leaders, they rejected Jesus because of fear and jealousy. What is your response to Jesus? Jesus challenged, do you believe this? How do you respond to Jesus? Is it with faith? Is it with fear or rejection? And why do you respond to Jesus in that way? I think it's worth taking some time to reflect on that. No matter what your response is, I I would encourage you through this next week, spend some time reflecting on how you respond to Jesus and why. Why you respond in that way. As I pondered Martha and her response to Jesus, I was taken with Martha's journey of faith. In verse 21, we have a mixture of both disappointment and faith. When Martha says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Martha voices her sorrow and perhaps even an accusation um, against Jesus for not arriving in time to save her brother. But she also expresses a measure of faith. Then in response to Jesus confronting her about who he is, she makes a great confession of faith in him. In verse 27, when she says, Yes, Lord, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Now, as we move further into the narrative, Jesus goes to the grave where Lazarus is buried and commands the stone be rolled away from the entrance. Verse 39 Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. It struck me that Martha's journey of faith is not a linear progression. It is not on and up to the right in a straight line. Martha has this great insight and confession about who Jesus is. And then just a short time later, she's protesting about Jesus' course of action. Martha is up and down. You might even say she's two steps forward and one step back in her faith. 
If that's how you feel in your faith journey sometimes, take heart. Don't, don't be discouraged or disheartened. If you sometimes doubt or question what God is up to, because our faith journey is not a straight linear, linear progression. Our faith rides the bumps and trials of life. I was talking about this with a mate several weeks ago and I was hesitating to use the term doubt because I'm not convinced that I'd describe Martha as doubting. And he threw the word at me, gap. And I liked that. There was a gap between what Martha confessed with her heart and who Jesus is. And because of that gap, Martha was like, whoa, Jesus, uh, just hold up there for a minute. What do you think you're doing? Had Martha, in the time that it took her to meet with Jesus on the outskirts of Bethany and then walk with him to the tomb where her brother was buried, in that time frame, had Martha stopped believing that Jesus was the Messiah? No, no. She still believed that with all her heart. But when Jesus asked for the stone to be rolled away, Martha's protest reveals a gap. A gap between what she knew to be true of Jesus and who Jesus really is. Martha did not fully understand the implications of Jesus' statement when he told her, I am the resurrection and the life. She did not fully understand what Jesus' messiahship and lordship over death meant. Our theme for this year is going deeper. There's always more to know about Jesus. There's always more to experience of him. And I'd even go so far as to say that I think we always live with a gap because there is always more to know and experience and understand of him. And I love Jesus' response to Martha. As she reveals this gap, and Jesus responds to her in verse 40, when he says, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Jesus' response is simply to say, believe. Believe in me, the resurrection and the life. So where is your gap? Where is your gap where your faith and experience of Jesus perhaps don't yet match the fullness of who Jesus is. I think one way to identify where we might have a gap is where you can see and understand that you're saying, but Jesus, hang on a moment, Jesus. I'm not sure about that, Jesus. I think that might be a pretty good indication that there's a gap there. But even with a gap, Martha still followed Jesus. Jesus is wanting to do something. He's wanting to do something in you, with you and through you, which is currently beyond what you understand about Jesus. And Jesus would simply say to you, believe. Believe in me. Will you follow him? Will you follow him as Martha followed? I asked the question earlier, if you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. What was your response to that? What was your response to Jesus' challenge? Do you believe this? I want to give you an opportunity now to respond to Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that he is Lord over death and gives eternal life? If you have never believed this before, today you can choose to believe. You can choose to believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And in a moment when I pray, I'm going to ask that you put your hand up nice and high and let me know that you are choosing to believe. And if you're online, you can hit uh, the prayer button and someone from our online team will connect with you. If you have already believed, if you can say, yes, I believe, then spend these next moments 
in prayer of thankful, uh, thankfulness and gratitude toward Jesus. That he is the resurrection and the life. So let's all bow our heads, close our eyes. And if, if you're in the room and you would like to choose to believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, you've never chosen to believe that before. Or perhaps you have, but it was a long time ago and you've turned away from God. Then I'd ask you now to put your hand up nice and high. And if you're online, hit that uh, prayer button. And let us know that you're choosing to believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. God, we thank you for those who have been choosing to believe in you today. We thank you, Jesus that you are the resurrection. And you proved that as you were raised from the dead on Easter Sunday. And thank you, Jesus, that you bring life. And it's not just a future promise of eternal life, as wonderful as that is, but it's a a full life, an abundant life now that you offer us too. I pray that we would know and move and experience your life today. I also want to pray today for those as we just remain in an attitude of prayer. Those who uh, can see that there's a gap right now in their experience and understanding of who Jesus is. You recognize that there's an area of life where you are saying, but Jesus. And Jesus simply says, believe in me. What is the step of obedience that Jesus is calling you to make today? Just sit before God and allow his spirit to speak to you. Martha's step of obedience was to allow Jesus to roll that stone away. She could have said no. But she didn't. And her brother was resurrected from the dead. What is your step of obedience that Jesus is asking you to make as you believe in him? God, I pray for courage. God, as people perhaps recognize that they have a gap and they've been saying, just hold on a moment, Jesus. I'm not sure about this. I pray for courage for them to step out in faith to follow you. And as they do that, to see how you will bring restoration. I don't know what that word might mean to you. Restore is a word. It was courage and restore were the two words I I felt on my heart to pray today. What is it that God wants to restore in your life as you follow him? You may only know that as you take that step of faith so I pray for courage and I pray that you would do your restoring work Jesus in your name we pray Amen